Hello, I'm Paul Richards. In this episode of The Latest Science, we speak to Academy Fellow Professor Eddie Holmes from the University of Sydney. His work focuses on the evolution and emergence of infectious diseases, particularly the mechanisms by which viruses jump species. He's been at the forefront of work aimed at understanding how that happened with COVID-19. Eddie, thanks for being with us. We've heard a lot of speculation about the origins of this virus. What do we know for sure? So we know that this virus was most likely present in animal populations in China. We think the most likely animal that it would have started off in would have been bats. We know that bats carried on coronaviruses. And then it probably, we can't be sure, but we think it probably jumped from a bat into another animal. And that other animal was probably near a human, maybe in some sort of market situation. And so we're not sure that intermediate animal species is yet. That needs to be kind of looked at further. But maybe that intermediate animal species in a market then passed the virus to humans. And that's how it's kind of started spreading, probably in Wuhan, and then it's, got, it's gone global. Now, some reports have pointed the finger at wet markets. For those unfamiliar, what is a wet market? And do you think that they are part of the problem? Yeah, so wet markets, and I visit markets like this a number of times, they're markets where you find um, live animals being sold. So you go to these markets, you find a whole, a different mammalian species in cages kind of stacked next to each other or on, on the floor. And so the people working in the, in the market are directly next to and working with wildlife. That's the critical thing. These are wildlife. It's not farmed animals. It's not domestic animals. It's wildlife animals. And so the problem is that obviously if that wildlife animal has a virus, it's picked up from a bat itself, and we're interacting with them in the market situation, there's a good chance that the virus will then spread to the person handling the animal, and that person will then go home and spread to someone else, and et cetera, and we have an outbreak. And that's kind of what we think most likely happened here. How does a virus like COVID-19 actually get transferred from another animal to a human? And I mean, is that common? Yeah, so we, we obviously we don't know exactly what happened in this case. And we, we may never know exactly the precise chain of events of, 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 of what happened. What we suspect happened, a, a good kind of model, is that someone in, in a market situation or would have been handling an animal and that animal would have had maybe a respiratory secretion that would have the virus in it, like, like we have. The virus in, in, in humans is a, is a nasal pharyngeal virus, respiratory virus. And that thing, that could have also happened in the animal. And so you can, it doesn't take much imagination that um, the, the animal excretes that virus in, in respiratory fluid. The person then touches their hands, they touch their nose, et cetera, et cetera. And then you have an outbreak. Now, again, that's just the model. We don't really know exactly what happened. And we may never really know in detail. But you can, those sorts of events seem very plausible. And so people handling wildlife are always at risk of these sorts of infections. So very simple things. We need to take great care. We handle any wildlife species. Is it common for uh, viruses to um, be perhaps carried by or, or infecting uh, another animal and then also picked up by human? I'd also note that uh, pets, for example, seem not to be uh, at risk from COVID-19 as far as we know. Uh, is this kind of transfer between species common of, of viruses? Yeah, so so viruses, RNA viruses particularly, viruses very commonly jump species boundaries. It's, it's their kind of general mode of life. That's what they want to do. So a virus wants to find a new cell to infect. And that cell can be in the same species or it can be in different species. As long as it finds a kind of cell it can infect and replicate in, it's very, very happy. And so what we found for many viruses is that they, they can very commonly jump species boundaries. They're very happy to do that. And for some reason, coronaviruses are particularly good at infecting and jumping to multiple animal species. And they do it all the time. And myself and colleagues have sampled lots of coronaviruses from, from um, different populations of animals. And we see jumping of species um, as a very, very regular occurrence. So I, I was not at all surprised that this, this thing happened. It, we've been predicting this for a long time. It really was something that was very clearly going to happen in, in, um, at some point, and it has happened. And it's just the way that these viruses are very able to jump species boundaries. And, of course, the way humans live today in this very big, connected, fluid world, they can then, if they do get in humans, they can spread very quickly. 
to a kind of pandemic scare as, as is happening here. As you've mentioned, you know, health authorities, scientists have warned that this something like this could happen for a very long time. Now that it's happened in this way with COVID-19, why do we seem to be underprepared to respond? Or is that is that the wrong way to, to characterise <laughs> what's happening? I, I, do, I do think there was um, some complacency and I do think we're under, underprepared. I think the real warning um, alarm bell was SARS in 2003. And it's a very analogous situation to here. So in SARS, what happened was, again, it was a bat virus. We think the bat, the bat then passed the virus to an animal called a civet, it's kind of cat-like animal, then from a civet into a human. So again, maybe in a market situation. So SARS should have told us then that we need to reduce our exposure to these wild animals in market settings and kind of wildlife trade. That's what we should have done. What we should have also have done is started to make um, cross-protect, what's called cross-protective vaccines or universal vaccines, like the one they're proposing for influenza. And those vaccines should be made for all the types of viruses we think can jump from animals to humans, like coronaviruses. And the same way, we want broad acting antivirals that can um, and work against a range of viruses. So what we should have done is stockpile those, and then when we get a, an outbreak, we can start, we can use the ones we have ready. Now I say those words, make a universal vaccine, make broad protective um, antivirals. It's very easy to say, obviously it's a, they're very hard to do. We, we spent years trying to make a, a universal flu vaccine, haven't quite got there yet, but we should have at least started the research program on doing that. Some, so SARS is 17 years ago, so after SARS. We didn't do that. And there were still there were very few people working on coronaviruses and very, very few people, if any, work on coronavirus vaccines. And that was a mistake. We did drop the ball there. So clearly now, though, going forward, you can certainly expect there'll be a huge effort to make these broadly protective vaccines, antivirals to stop it ever happening again. And part of that complacency, do you think that we have seen how effective vaccines have been over time we we know that we are now protected from many of uh, the viruses and diseases that have uh, claimed thousands and millions of lives over time and and so it's quite a shock when we have a virus like this um, suddenly reach the spread that it that it has I uh, yeah, no, I think it, I think it, I mean obviously it's shocked many people I, but I think the thing to remember about vaccines is they do take time to develop even now we're talking about next year realistically so we cannot add we cannot add a um a vaccine that's not going to work or even make things worse on top of already a very major global health problem so yes vaccines are great but they do take time that's why we need to preempt it for the future and have these sorts of universal vaccines ready right now that we can pull out of the freezer and use when necessary so Vaccines, they have made us complacent. I think people don't realise how long it takes to really make a vaccine to, its, to the point where you can clinically apply it to people in, in, you know, in, in, um, in populations. I'd like to just put to, to bed, if you can, uh, some of the, the theories that have been floating around that this virus, for instance, was manufactured in a lab as part of some kind of biological warfare. Have you been able to prove that this is untrue? Obviously, people get very, um, when they see something so unusual and so seemingly out of the blue, lots of strange theories naturally sort of appear. I think there are a number of really clear reasons to believe this is not in any way a lab construct or a lab escape. And the, the, the key things are all the component bits of this virus, all the genes and bits, of the proteins that, that, that make up the COVID-19 virus, they are all found in natural animal species. There's nothing unusual about it. It has bits of, you know, looks like it's bits of bat virus, maybe pangolin virus. We know all the components are absolutely natural. They're all natural ingredients. Also, if someone was wanting to engineer a coronavirus, what they would naturally do is take the standard laboratory strain that's out there, and which there are a number of them, and they would manipulate a standard laboratory strain and turn it into what they wanted. And that's not what's happened here. This is not a standard laboratory strain. It looks for all the world, and I'm certain it is, a natural coronavirus that's come from an animal in a natural setting. There's nothing in there at all that, that is a signature of laboratory manipulation. So I think we can pretty safely 
put that um, that those conspiracy theories to bed. What have you learned so far about uh, this pandemic and, and and from it in reducing transmission of coronaviruses from animals to people? I think so. This pandemic really has, I think. For me, because I've been seeing this for a long time, it's really just um, confirmed what I kind of suspected already and I knew already, that the simplest way we can, as a species, stop these things happening again is to reduce our exposure to wildlife populations, Okay, particularly in these market situations and legal wildlife trade. We have to build simple barriers by, I would suggest, closing these, 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 these wet markets down really stopping the trade in wildlife species. Now, people argue that oh, it maybe it'll go underground. Any, but anything, though, that reduces the number of these and therefore reduces the exposure of humans to wildlife viruses must be a good thing. And SARS told us that, and this has told us that in even more dramatic and stark fashion. And we have to do this. And it's a very simple thing. It doesn't involve much money. It just involves governments policing these markets and stopping our close interactions with wildlife. So that's a very simple first step. Okay. Uh, it's obviously going to be uh, a long journey because these wet markets are um, very common all over the world. But uh, if, from a scientific point of view, you're saying that's the area that needs to be addressed uh, to, to stop this this uh, transmission from animals to humans, then, then that's really interesting point. Now, you've written a paper stating that coronaviruses have the capacity to jump species boundaries and adapt. So is it likely that we will see more pandemics like this in the future? Yeah, I mean, the way humans live today, and I, really they are just perfect from pandemics to occur. Look at this particular one. So it happens in Wuhan. So it's a major city in China, a major travel hub, and it happens just before the Lunar New Year, where million, literally millions of people move around China to return home for the, for, the, for the festival. And then, of course, China's a very well-connected country, then it spreads globally. So the way we live has just set it up for pandemics. Our modern connected world has set it up for pandemics to occur. So we are living in, a, in an age where they are very likely. And we know that wildlife species do carry lots of viruses, as I've said. Hopefully, though, hopefully, though, this will be the wake-up call we need for the world to change the way we live, to reduce our interaction with wildlife species and to try and prepare ourselves. I mean, really, people use the word preparedness very glibly, but to do it absolutely properly and to have good surveillance of, 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 of animal populations and human populations and to stockpile those broadly reacting um, vaccines and antivirals that we can deploy when we need to. Hopefully, this will be the, the, you know, the wake-up call for that. Now, you said that uh, in terms of the exit strategy for uh, this particular virus and, and how it's impacting us at the moment, a vaccine won't be available until likely next year. Um, what is the exit strategy then? Right. So the, the question is, and what we mean by exit strategy is how do we, um, we, we can reduce our transmission. We will do at the moment because we're following physical distancing and that's going to be a great thing. We all need to do that. That will reduce the number of cases in Australia to get to a very, very low level. But that's going to happen long before the vaccine will be available and we'll next year, as you said, for the vaccine. So what do we do in that interim period? What's the best way of keeping case numbers low while we wait for the vaccine to happen. And I, you know, there are many different suggestions of how to, how to best do that. Um, I'm not sure what the best one is. People will debate that. For me, though, I think what it must involve at some point is very, very heavy levels of testing. We can really accurately track who has the virus and if they're ill, we isolate them. And we do that as frequently as can we can across as broad a set of population as we can as we can, hopefully then we can track any chains of transmission and and quickly close them down. So I'm hoping testing, vigilance, isolation, infected popular people or contacts, that may be enough to keep the levels very, very low until the vaccine becomes online sometime next year. Okay, Professor Edward Holmes, thank you very much for your time. My pleasure. I'll be back on Friday with another edition of The Latest Science. My guest then will be renowned immunologist, Professor Ian Fraser. If you have questions you'd like him to answer, just leave them in the comments section below this post. I'm Paul Richards. See you on Friday. Music